Major funding for Frontline is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Tonight on Frontline, Vietnam 10 years after America's pullout. They need things from the, the, the West, from the world, from the, the commercial marketplaces. They need money, they need aid, they need equipment. What is life like there today? They live here, um, and uh, they don't have any other place to live. What are the legacies of that war? Vietnam is going to be a very, very poor country for a long time to come. Frontline presents an exclusive report, Vietnam Under Communism. From the network of public television stations, a presentation of KCTS Seattle. WNET New York, WPBT Miami, WTVS Detroit, and WGBH Boston. This is Frontline with Judy Woodruff. Good evening. Vietnam, once again, it is in the news as Vietnamese troops wage a new offensive against rebels in neighboring Cambodia. And Vietnam will remain in the news this year for another reason, an anniversary. It has been 20 years since the U.S. Marines landed there in 1965, and this spring the Socialist Republic of Vietnam will celebrate the 10th anniversary of the U.S. withdrawal in 1975. The Vietnam government is preparing for national celebration. The international press will gather. Special tours are being arranged. Vietnam will be putting on its best face for the world. Tonight on Frontline, an exclusive report by a team who recently spent 35 days in Vietnam, the longest visit by an American television crew since the end of the war. They obtained unique access, traveling across the country and visiting places no one else has yet seen. Tonight, their journey through a war-ravaged country, struggling now with the problems of peace and the challenges of living under a communist regime. Our report is called Vietnam Under Communism, co-produced for Frontline by Greg Pratt and Paul Henschel of television station WCCO in Minneapolis. Christmas in Hanoi, 1972. America unleashes a barrage on the capital of North Vietnam. The bombing, aimed at both the backs and the spirits of the people, is relentless. Devastating, but in vain. This is Vietnam today, as we found it more than a dozen years later. An independent, proud, hopeful country. A nation at relative peace, but after a thousand years of conflict, still poised for war. This too is Vietnam. Impoverished, depressed, ill-fed, ill-equipped, and ill at ease. Vietnam, a repressive, totalitarian society. Vietnam, a people America so intimately, yet so brutally met. A battleground America never fully understood. Today, still divided, distant, and forgotten. Rush hour in Hanoi, a 1930s French provincial city, frozen in time, and quite literally, an antique. It's a unique city. I mean, it's a city of bicycles and big trees, and it's a, a city of, of beautiful autumn sunshine. 
certainly this is a museum and there isn't a great deal of, of uh, construction. Richard Bernowski is the Australian ambassador to Vietnam. The Australians who fought alongside the Americans in Vietnam have recently established diplomatic ties with Hanoi. Vietnam itself wishes to extend its own range of contacts with the world beyond the very narrow uh, set of uh, friends and, and allies it has at present. It's very important and you can't ignore, as I said before, you can't ignore a country of 60 million people. Hanoi and the surrounding Red River Delta is one of the most densely populated and poorest areas in the world. This has been the seat of communist inspiration and ideals for more than 50 years. The people, mostly peasants, are grim but determined and resigned to life in a socialist system. Most of them are not communists, i.e. members of the party, but most of them would feel uh, genuinely that the system of government they have here is the one that they want. A young guard who lost two brothers and a sister in the bombing explains the allegiance to the state and Ho Chi Minh, Vietnam's late communist leader. Ho Chi Minh tried to solve the problems of our people, to bring happiness to Vietnam. He gained independence for us from the imperialists. We remember his teachings, and both myself and the people love him dearly. Every Sunday morning, some 15 to 20,000 people pass through Ho's tomb where he lies in state a building which is one of the few new construction projects completed since the war. In the north, the loyalties to Ho Chi Minh are not as entirely deep-rooted as they may seem. These children, many of whom are the more privileged sons and daughters of party or government officers, sing only the official songs of the state. Their loyalties, in other words, are not only encouraged, they are enforced. For the older generation in the North, most of whom live outside the cities, political allegiance is less of a concern. Once they worked for the French, today they toil for the state. They are enterprising, though poor. Above all, they have endured. You see, in the history of mankind, no other country had to suffer so long and so heavy as Vietnam from foreign domination. We have had been 1,000 years under domination. Nguyen Ko Tak is Vietnam's foreign minister. Considered to be one of the most powerful members of the Vietnamese Politburo, Tak grew up with a legacy of war. Too much invasion. And the bloodiest war in the world, it is the Nixon and Johnson war. And we have, we have paid so much our blood to our, for our independence. No country, no other country in the world have paid so much blood for its independence. Many parts of the North still bear the scars of war. As we traveled outside of Hanoi, we saw plants, roads, and bridges in dire need of repair. Here at Zak Mu, an artillery base near the former demilitarized zone, it seems that America left only yesterday. This is a forbidden zone. Live ammunition remains strewn about. We proceeded only with the assistance of our guide, Tuan, Uh, even after 10 years in this area, still very dangerous. A lot of mice still left there and some kind of uh, 
bombs and if you are not careful when you step on very easy to step on mice and we may die here Since the end of the Vietnam War an estimated 5 to 6000 Vietnamese have been either killed or wounded as they stumble across live ammunition Along coastal highway 1 Tons of so-called GI junk litter the landscape. As America withdrew from Vietnam, millions of dollars worth of military hardware was abandoned. Much of it simply left to rot. Here, in a Hanoi suburb, the wreckage of an American plane peers from a community pond. Bunkers first built by the French and later used by the Americans still stand today, testaments to a century of war. In all, an estimated three million Vietnamese people died in wars with the French and the U.S. More than half of the casualties were non-combatant civilians. Virtually everyone can claim a family member killed, wounded, or missing in action. Chúng tôi như thế là bom đến rào rào. Chúng tôi rất căm thù của giặc Mỹ. A bomb hit my house and it collapsed. No one died, but five members of my family were injured. So we became very angry at the Americans and asked the world to put them on trial and destroy them to the end. Here you know 10 years are torn by war. And 15 million tons of bomb drop on in my country. Twice the number of bomb drop during the Second World War. So you you can imagine how big uh, what is the dimensions of our wounds of war. Perhaps Vietnam's most controversial wounds, which the Vietnamese frequently show visitors, are on display here at Tuzu Hospital. Amen. These are all deformed babies. We keep them for research purposes. As you see, some have cancer. The deformities are the result of poisons used by the Americans in Vietnam. Every year this ward is full. We have about 80 beds, and most are occupied with women who have cancers, of the cervix, of the ovaries, and so forth. The percentage of women with cancer in Vietnam is very high, and this, we believe, is because of defoliation. According to a 1983 international research symposium, the incidence of still and premature births, as well as birth defects in Vietnam, is rising. Relative to other third world countries, gynecological diseases and birth deformities are unusually high. These are Siamese twins. I think there is a relation to the spraying, but it is not clear. We cannot measure dioxin in the blood, the tissues, or the organs. We can only experiment, and maybe in the future we will know more about this problem. The toll on the Vietnamese people is even greater than the rising rate of medical problems. As we journeyed south through Hue and Da Nang, we met a fisherman and former refugee in what for many Vietnamese was a confusing, if not absurd, war. I didn't understand anything about this war, about all the fighting. I met Americans but they never hurt me. They weren't fighting me. And to this day, I still don't understand it all. This fisherman, who lost a brother and a nephew in the war, says his life has improved little since the fighting ended. Many in the cities would say the same.
Ho Chi Minh City, or so at least the government has renamed it. Virtually everyone here, though, still calls this Saigon. Saigon, Hanoi's longtime antagonist to the south, the former seat of both French and American influence and power. A westernized city where in the past people got raucous and rich. Today, Saigon is an occupied city. A virtual police state whose subdued population is constantly and carefully watched. If you're talking about the state and state surveillance, Vietnamese state surveillance, yes, of course, there's a strong element of that. There are violations of human rights. Uh, there, there's no uh, course of, of uh, justice as we know it. Uh, there, there is a certain degree of capriciousness in the law here. People are taken away without due process. These are Western systems of democracy and, and law that we respect. Uh, they don't necessarily respect them here. The Saigonese know that they're not trusted, and so they expect to be watched. And I think that uh, those factors contribute to a certain air of uh, tension uh, that one can feel in the streets of Saigon. The northern part Professor William Turley, a Vietnam analyst, recently returned from Vietnam. The regime trusts the people more in the north than it does in the south. Uh, the northern population doesn't require very close uh, regulation to stay in line. But the regime can't trust the south quite so much. Again, I don't have anything for work in this case. The people in Saigon are tightly controlled. And by administrative rule, they are forbidden to talk with foreigners. There's nothing for me work. This man, allowed to work only as a petty shopkeeper, risked an interview with us. Outside of market, I know people like that. Maybe in this case, can you help me? The my father and my sister, who worked many long time for U.S. government and likes the U.S. government very much, but now we cannot go to there. I can my I can do many work with American, but now I cannot do for my government. As most Vietnam experts would agree, Saigon remains under the control of the Hanoi government. But many of Hanoi's hand-picked officials here have been disciplined or removed, while Hanoi continues to proclaim national reunification and reconciliation. But if by national reconciliation you're talking about a burying of the hatchet, uh, that obviously has not taken place, and I doubt that it will take place in the lifetime of Vietnamese now living. There's no more freedom at all. No independence, no freedom. And hard life, miserable life. That's why people have to leave the country. One of these days, I wished I could see my family all over here. That's my last dream. I would like to be with my husband over there so I can stay home with him and take care of the family. It is my dream to spend my life in a home with my husband and children. Da Nang is home for Nguyen Tai Van, a mother of four and former bookkeeper for the Americans. She and her family have officially applied to leave Vietnam. Van's husband, Phan Bang, lives and works in the American Midwest. A former officer with the South Vietnamese Army, he stayed behind in 1975, reluctant but willing to work with the communists. He was instead imprisoned for five years at hard labor. He nearly died, but eventually escaped in a boat such as the one used by these fishermen. I escaped because I, I don't think I can stay in the camp forever and ever. I think in my mind, 
before I do that, I think that I better die out the ocean better than I die in the prison camp. How how do you do? How do you do? How do you do? Miss Isla. How do you do? Van is but one of more than half a million Vietnamese who have officially applied to leave Vietnam. Good morning, Peter. Peter. Because she has asked to go, she can no longer work. She has also lost her food ration privileges. They're very poor. Nobody's starving, but very poor. I think that uh, the life for my wife and children is come kind of harder if I'm not there. Uh, but for suppose if now I'm home, I cannot do nothing for them because I don't have a job. I don't have nothing to do. And sooner or later they send me to NEZ. NEZ, or New Economic Zone. Had Phan been released from a forced labor camp, he and his family would likely have been sent to an NEZ such as this. NEZs are planned agricultural communities, sometimes constructed to reclaim defoliated land. More than a million people have been sent to NEZs, many displaced persons who lost their homes and villages during the war. Others come from the ranks of the unemployed. Some are so-called war criminals. They are assigned to work here. The government calls them volunteers. People uh, were simply rounded up on trucks and taken out to the countryside and deposited next to the road with a scrap of barbed wire and a hoe and said, uh, till your field. Of course, that was not adequate preparation of the site and uh, people very soon, as soon as they could, made their way back to Saigon. On the day we visited this NEZ, guards with automatic weapons patrolled work areas. We asked the director of this work zone why so many people had tried to escape. You see, many of the people brought here from the cities did service work for the old government, for the Americans. They had good jobs or did illegal things. They earned an easy living. And now they resist our socialist plans for a better life. They like entertainment more than they like having to work hard for a living. New economic zones have met with mixed results. Some are productive. Others are located in areas with poor soil. Many have been mismanaged, and few have met their full production quotas. Some people, mostly displaced peasants, have embraced their new homes. But generally, it would be, I think, accurate to say that the concept of a new economic zone has not been a sensationally popular thing in Vietnam, and they themselves freely admit this. With many segments of the state-run economy either stagnant or failing, Vietnam is deeply in debt. The people in the South have hardly embraced the notion of working for the state. Despite extensive propaganda efforts, the majority of the people here remain, at best, indifferent to the policies of the new regime. Many of the people have yet to reap the benefits promised by the communists. <laughs> yes, uh, they live. They live here, um, and uh, they don't have any other place to live. She's uh, she came into the city in 1980, and she's lived out on the streets uh, like this in various places since, since then. The average income is about 175 dollars per year. The population is growing out of control. Tens of thousands are un or underemployed surviving any way they can. 
Uh, she um, she gets uh, old refuse paper. She's a, a garbage collector, in other words. David Marr, a former U.S. Marine intelligence officer who served in Vietnam, is currently an historian with the Australian National University in Canberra. As a scholar, this is his third visit to Vietnam. There hasn't been a great deal of improvement uh, since, since the end of the war overall. If they don't manage to constrain the population growth, no, it won't do any good to uh, increase production. It'll all be eaten up by new mouths. Rampant inflation, approaching 100% per year, eats up the wages of low-paid government workers. Rice, meats, sugar, cloth, even cooking oil are rationed. So that's almost a month's salary for the, uh, the uh, ordinary uh, state employee. They can't live on their salaries. They just can't do it. The people who are making money in Vietnam today uh, are those who sa have some little private scam or are able to use their official position for corrupt purposes. But people who try to live within the means given to them officially by the state can barely do it. My dream is how to have uh, enough food for the people, clothes for the people, medical care for the people, and education for all the children. The government claims the literacy rate is high. Outside observers say just over half the people can read and write. Political connection often has as much to do with who stays in school as does ability or performance. Those with no opportunity to go to school find other ways to buy their time. For the children of Vietnam, the future is bleak. Disease and malnutrition are common. Medicines in short supply. On the average, the government spends about one dollar per person per year on health care. On the average, a child in Vietnam today can expect to live just 47 years. In all, the quality of life in Vietnam has actually fallen since the end of the war. I feel I'd like to lick their wounds and recover. Uh, they need things from the, the, the West, from the world, from the, the commercial marketplaces. They need money, they need aid, they need equipment, they need stimulation. I don't think uh, many Americans feel they have any obligation to Vietnam in terms of reparations, uh, in terms of paying the Vietnamese something for the pain uh, of the war. That's a reality. I would like to ask uh, what is the responsibility of the, the, the United States to hinder the war, the war in Vietnam? Uh, no, I don't think the Vietnamese government continue, can continue to blame uh, all their problems on the Americans and before them the French. Um, uh, they've got a, that, that, that's a, um, a rationale that's going to run out of time uh, sooner or later. When the war wound up, many of them thought that uh, within a couple decades, Vietnam would have completed the initial stages of industrialization and be well on its way towards taking a place beside uh, the other industrialized nations of the communist uh, world. But that is just not going to happen. Vietnam is going to be a very, very poor country for a long time to come. The Mekong Delta, the richest and most productive region in all of Vietnam. Expansive and remote, this is a haven for pockets of resistance to communism. This is home for millions of poor peasants, 
many of whom openly shrug communists' efforts to collectivize and control agriculture in the South. This is also home for To Um, a 14-year-old Amerasian boy still living in Vietnam. The communists are not much different than the government they took over from. Mike Shado lives in Titusville, Florida. A Vietnam veteran, he and his Vietnamese wife, T left Vietnam in 1971. It was difficult enough for me to get permission for my wife to leave with me. And we left our son with the grandparents. Tot Um is Mike Shado's son, an American citizen named Lance. Too ill to travel with his father, Lance was left behind with his grandparents. Her family was way down in the Mekong Delta, and a very poor family, and if you don't know anyone in Vietnam, you don't get anything done. All I want is just to have our son back. It's been a long time, and I still haven't seen him yet. Lance Shado is but one of an estimated eight to 15,000 Amerasian children still in Vietnam. The Shados have pleaded with the Vietnamese government and officially requested not only their son's release, but his grandparents as well. Thus far, they have had no response from the Vietnamese government. In Vietnam, being an admiration child has a, a social and racial stigma attached to it. I have to do everything I can. I'm sorry. For all of them. And uh, so that's where we are right now. Nowhere. We have nothing. We are sick. And I have asked my daughter to send us money. The Shados say they have sent money to their family in the Delta, both to support them and to pay the bribes they say are required to get Lance out. Most of the money has never been received. The Vietnamese officials with whom we inquired about the Shado case claim they have tried repeatedly to contact the family. Yes, uh, we have heard about them. Um, actually, we, um, we have seen this family on the special list given to us by the American authorities. They also claim the government does not open mail and take money. They emphatically deny there are any required bribes and payoffs. If they could have the money to pay off the officials, there would be no problem for the exit visas, there would be no problem for the paperwork to get up to Ho Chi Minh City and get on an airplane and leave. But if you're from a, a poor peasant family, nobody has the time for you. And he, my son wrote a letter for me and I cry a lot, you know. He say, it really hurt. And my family hurt very much too. When I get him, how old is he going to be? 16, 17, 18, 19, 20? What chance is he really going to have for an education or an opportunity in life over here now? Let alone someone who has to learn a whole new culture, a whole new language. And they don't want him. They don't want Amerasian people. They want nothing left to remind them of the war. I've already lost so many years with him. And I'm going to get someone that I really don't even know. In Da Nang, where there are many Amerasians, these children are not as fortunate as Lance Shado. They have not heard from their father for more than six years. Few American GIs acknowledge the children they left behind. Uh, theo tôi nghĩ, ông có bổn phận đối với con ông thôi. 
For me, America does not matter so much, but their father has obligations, obligations to take them and care for them, for their schooling and so forth. Here, I can only do my best, but it is too difficult for me to take care of this big a family. This woman has five Amerasian children. Her youngest son is Randy. I want to go live with my father, but my mother has to work hard and has to stay here to take care of the others. Otherwise, she would like to go to America with my father. Both the Vietnamese and American governments have discussed the Amerasian issue on several recent occasions. The Vietnamese say all Amerasians may leave at any time. The U.S. has agreed to accept them. And we've made it clear we'd like to permit them to come to the United States and through something called the orderly departure program that the UN runs we have been able to get out roughly 3,500 of these children and their families so far we prepared to take them all in a in an orderly way we think that uh, presently the American authorities uh, are solving this problem uh, too slow and uh, the number they accept is to li uh, limit it. The gap between rhetoric and reality on both sides remains wide. Bureaucratic delays and red tape seem endless. Randy, in Da Nang, will probably never know his father. Lance Shado is now a young teenager. With no school to attend, he can only learn the life of a peasant farmer. This is Viet Duc Bui. College educated in the U.S., Viet returned to Vietnam in 1971. Neither a government nor military official, he became a man caught in the middle of the Vietnam War. With a communist victory, he was suspect, not permitted to work. He left for America in 79. It's very difficult to make the decision to leave my family. I know that. And uh, I remember it was a rainy day. I uh, was informed that uh, the trip is ready if I wanted to go. So um, I went with my wife and uh, I remember I look at the two boys. They were so young five years old and three and a half years old. They didn't know what was going on. So uh, I took a bike and carried my wife to a post office in Saigon and uh, some people picked me up and, uh, and that was the last time I saw my family. We were surely that we were very sad. And we always uh, expect that we can join. My, I can take my children to join her, their father soon, as soon as possible. An, Viet's wife, lives with her family in Saigon. She would spend most of her time taking care of the boys. That's what I want. I worry whether that, whether it, it is feasible in my lifetime that I will be able to see my family again or not. My wife is very religious. She believes strongly in Buddhism. The Vietnamese government encourages atheism. The majority of the Vietnamese, however, remain Buddhists. The government regards monks as unproductive and potentially dissident free thinkers. Both Buddhism and Catholicism are discouraged. The numbers of monks and priests has fallen significantly since the occupation of the South. I think my wife is becoming more and more religious because religion would provide her the most relief and the most 
philosophical way of life for her to struggle on through life. But I realized that to cope with the emotions and problems that my family as well as myself are having, we have to be very patient and we have to have faith that eventually our family will be reunified. And that's what we are praying for and hoping for. Well over a million people have already fled Vietnam. The exodus continues today. Many of those who remain or resist relocation to economic zones jam an already overcrowded and sullen Saigon. Others fill the many rivers that snake through the cities, boat people with no place to go. In Da Nang, Phan Bang's wife, Van, idly awaits permission to leave, permission that may well never come. Viet's wife, An, can only continue her five-year-long vigil. For its part, the Vietnamese government has granted some 30,000 exit permits. But the U.S. will accept only about 1,200 Vietnamese per month. So the process of orderly departure of family reunification is both painful and slow. Most of those permitted to leave are those against whom the communists bear no grudge. Those for whom the communists have no room or no use within their system. For the North Vietnamese, the memories, the images of war have yet to fade away. An air raid siren is still used to mark the noon hour in Hanoi. Along Vietnam's remote northern border with China, we came across a citizen's militia preparing for what they regard as the inevitable, an invasion from China. This citizen's militia, who are otherwise simple hill tribe peasants, form Vietnam's first line of defense. An ancient foe, China did, in fact, invade Vietnam in 1979 and still occupies territory within the country. And between Vietnam and China, we are in a state of a war. And now they are still threatening my country and Southeast Asia. They, are, they, are not, they, they do not stop their policy of, of expansionism. They are seen occupying a territory of India, of Vietnam, you see. Vietnam's historic and recently rekindled tensions with China have in part led to the build-up of a massive, though inexperienced, army. We encountered these troops in training near the China border. Together with the militia, they form a force of more than one million men, the fourth largest standing army in the world. But if you were to ask, does it need those men to defend itself? Is the military threat to its uh, security so real and so great that it really needs all these men under arms? I suppose the answer is no. In addition to its size, 
Vietnam's army is costly, soaking up more than half the national budget, as well as the best and the brightest from Vietnam's technical schools. The military also has political clout. A fourth of the Politburo and nearly one third of the Central Committee are military officers. New members of the party also tend to come from the military. General Huang Phong is a division commander who fought both the French and the Americans. When the Vietnam War ended, we began to rebuild. We had many, many difficulties, housing, transportation, and so forth. But now China is waging war. So once again, our strategic task is to be ready to defend the country. Military leaders themselves have noted that uh, this, uh, there's a drain on the civilian sector, and it can only uh, hurt them over the long run. Kampuchea, formerly Cambodia. Here, Vietnam's army is also deeply entrenched. To liberate, it claims, the Kampuchean people from the horrors of the Pol Pot regime. In the late 1970s, Pol Pot, leader of the communist Khmer Rouge, imprisoned and tortured thousands of his own people. In all, an estimated two to three million people died during the Pol Pot terror. He buried many of them in a mass grave outside of Phnom Penh. The Vietnamese say they are fighting here to protect Cambodia from Pol Pot's return. Critics say Vietnam wants to control, if not colonize, a vulnerable neighbor whom the Vietnamese distrust. We have saved the Cambodian people from the, from the genocide. So we are there to help the Cambodian people. And uh, you know, now they are still the danger of coming back of Pol Pot. Most Western nations have condemned Vietnam for what they call an invasion an occupation of Cambodia. It's the Vietnamese who are trying to rule Cambodians. And it's ironic that for all of the Vietnamese talk about nationalism and independence, it's they who are suppressing the independent nationhood of another country. Vietnamese attacks in and around Cambodia have angered much of the West, including the United States. Vietnam, therefore, remains totally dependent upon the Soviet Union. In addition to billions of dollars in aid, the Soviet bloc ships into Haiphong Harbor and other ports virtually all of Vietnam's fuel, military, and essential supplies. Vietnam is in hock to the Soviet Union for the next five or ten years. They look at it as a uh, comradely relationship. This is the socialist system that they're, they're part of. But in almost the next breath, they will also say that they very much want to have relations with the capitalist system. I was uh, here in, in 1980, and there was much less uh, market activity at, the, at that time. Uh, it's really been in the last three or four years, I think, which it's, uh, it's blossomed or exploded, depending on what, uh, what, what word you want to use. If there is a new battleground in Vietnam today, it is in the marketplace. Reform-minded planners within the Communist Party have begun a series of economic reforms, grudgingly allowing private trade on what they call open or free markets, especially in the South.
Today, nearly three-fourths of all consumer goods are bought and sold on free markets. Dr. David Marr says such capitalist initiatives have taken root here because the state-run economy is in a shambles. Well, they have to um, uh, rely on their, their wives to be out in the market like this. Um, they often, uh, their children can't go to school because they've got to be out trying to make something. Um, uh, after hours, they, um, especially if they've got a little bit of land uh, in the countryside, they'll be out there trying to grow something for themselves. Um, there's a hundred different ways that they have to try and make a living. Though socialists at heart, Vietnamese planners seem to be following the path of China, which has of late introduced sweeping capitalist reforms into its state-run economy. Nguyen Co Tak is one such reformer. But the peasant, they can, sell, they can sell their goods freely because they are producer. After sell, selling to the, to the state, after paying the taxes, Economic reforms also include incentive, bonus, and contract systems. Again, capitalist ideas. The productivity gains have been significant. Two record grain harvests in a row. If the reforms continue, Vietnam may soon approach self-sufficiency in food production. In the north, Private shops and markets are appearing as well, though party purists fear what they call creeping capitalism. Often, or sometimes as a crackdown, uh, when there are perceptions of corruption and, and tax avoidance, not just here but in the South too, but uh, generally the, the, the private sector won't disappear altogether. Most people in the North shop in state stores, austere warehouses which are often empty due to a shortage of goods. Resentment toward private traders grows deep within the ranks of government workers. They see them creating opportunities for people in the private sector to make much more money than they, the state cadres, do. And they resent it. They say, you know, after all, we're the ones who fought and died for the revolution and in the name of socialism. Now you're going to permit capitalists? <laughs> to make more money than we do? This is not fair. Here in Saigon, aging hardline leaders continue to lose their grip. The Communist Party is actually losing members. Crackdowns, fines, arrest, and imprisonment are common. Nonetheless, export-import companies are thriving. Private traders continue to flourish. There has been change. Now the question is how much of this activity we see in Ho Chi Minh City is froth uh, and how much of it is um, some sort of is, is substantial growth or development. This could become a, a major center of activity in Southeast Asia. But it all depends on policy. Um, uh, I don't see it happening in the next 10 years, um, even with the best of policies. Economic reforms and capitalist initiatives have so far prevailed in Vietnam because they are popular with the people. If allowed to continue, the policies and ideas of reform-minded Vietnamese leaders could bring the Vietnamese people both independence and prosperity. It looks like a dream. And I think my dream is modest. Within five or ten years, we think the life in Vietnam would be better. And firstly, peaceful. We'll have peace.
In the center of Hanoi is a building, freshly painted, ringed by a wall and an iron gate. It stands empty. Vietnam hopes it will be the site of the new U.S. Embassy, but there are still no diplomatic relations between the two countries. Foreign Minister Nguyen Co Thoc, the number two leader in Vietnam, is the main advocate within the Politburo for improving relations with us. Co Thoc is in charge of the continuing discussions on MIAs and resettling Vietnam's political prisoners in the U.S. And he told the producers of this report he no longer expects U.S. aid, but he does want diplomatic and trade relations. One final note, the producers of this program made a formal humanitarian request for exit permits for the family members interviewed in this report, who are still in Vietnam. Just a few weeks ago, we learned that Viet Duc Bui's wife, who had prayed for her family's reunion at the Buddhist temple, has received her exit permit. Viet Duc Bui will be reunited with his wife and two boys within the year. Next week on Frontline, a look at a frightening phenomenon, street gangs in our cities. It's the story of one man fighting gang violence. I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to let them know somebody got standing. Now they going to run me away from you? No way. Yeah, well, I'll leave. I'll leave you in the box. A shootout, murder charges, death threats. Who's to blame? What can be done? Mr. Hawkins' son blew away one of the gang members. The bottom line is they are going to not be satisfied until they get somebody from the Hawkins family. The program is called Shootout on Imperial Highway. Next week on Frontline. I'm Judy Woodrow. Good night. For a transcript of this program, please send $4 to Frontline, Box 322, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. Major funding for Frontline was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide.